And she's like, oh man, like you work from home. Like I want to have a job like you. You know what I mean? But like what she's seeing is like years of work allowing me to sit in this room Mm -hmm. and stay home and have conversations with people. You know what I mean? Like she didn't see me up on Saturday at two o'clock in the morning being on call, deploying software and doing this and doing that, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? She didn't see all of that, right? So I'm like, yo, you, I'm like, if you want to get here, like you got 10 years. Yep. You know what I mean? If you want to do what I do, I'm being the position that I'm in. You got 10 years, right? Um, and again, that's not to deter or to scare anybody, but the fact of the matter is like, you have to put in the effort. Hey, Cecil, thanks for coming on the show today. No, man, it's been, it's been a pleasure. And you know what? I feel like me and you have been going back and forth so long to try to make this happen. So, you know, I'm glad I could make it and we could finally have this, this conversation, you know? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Tag, tag your it finally. And so tell us a bit about where you're living at the moment yeah, yeah. in the world and, and what you're sort of working on. Sure. I'll give you, I'll give for folks that don't know me, I'll give you a little bit of background. So originally I was born in Antigua. Um, you know, lived in Antigua until I was about like 19, you know, came up for, mm-hmm. uh, to Florida for college. And I've just kind of been in Florida ever since, you know what I mean? Uh, I went to Florida Institute of Technology, just like yourself, you know what I mean? Got, got some degrees there, mm-hmm. um, studied computer science, software engineering, like those types of things. Cause that's, that's really what my passion is. Um, you know, just trying to, trying to build the machine or bend the machine to my will, you know what I mean? This <laughs> has always been like something that's been really exciting for me to kind of focus on. And, um, you know, throughout, throughout time, oh, I'm sorry, let me turn that off. Throughout, you know, my career, I've had an opportunity to work at a lot of interesting places. And I think that has, has helped me develop a lot of perspective, which I think is important. But, you know, throughout time, I've been able to work in education. I've worked in finance. I've worked in um, developer productivity. You know, I've been a teacher, I've done podcasting, I've done videos, I've done a lot of different things. And, you know, right now, I think a lot of that kind of just helps bring me to the position that I'm in right now, um, which right now I'm currently at Stripe, you know, doing developer advocacy and, and trying to build out what hopefully will be seen as some of the best developer advocates in the world. Like that's, you know, that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it. You know, nothing, nothing I do is going to be half, right? Like if I'm going to do it, it has, it has to be the best of everything. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of just the focus that, um, that I have right now with like, you know, the job and the team and, and all of that. Great. So tell us a bit about Stripe for maybe those who are not too familiar with Stripe, especially in the Caribbean region. In addition, um, sort of what is developer advocacy? Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off with what is Stripe. So Stripe, their mission statement is to increase the GDP of the internet, right? And so, so what, is, what does that mean, right? When you think about how the internet is so pervasive today, right? Like almost everything that we do happens online. It happens on the internet. And because of that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use a very cliche term, right? Like it's made the world a lot smaller, right? It's allowed us to connect with each other in a way that we really haven't been able to over time. And, you know, one of the important aspects of that has always been commerce, right? Like e-commerce, you think about international exchange, you think about like the buying and selling of goods, not just from like, you know, the shop down the street, but you think about like, Hey, I want to do this on a larger scale, like across countries and continents and things of that nature. And so the the mission of Stripe is to make that easier and not only easier for big corporations, but for anyone. So it might be, you know, Mark, maybe one day you say, Hey, you want to start doing selling books and you, but you want to self-publish, you know what I mean? Like, how can we enable you to do that? You know, maybe you might have folks that maybe they're, they're content creators or maybe, you know, they're teachers or whatever the case is, right? Like, how can we enable everybody to be able to remove some of that difficult administrivia and just make mm-hmm. it easier for us to be able to, you know, just, you know, set up subscription services, buy and sell goods online and all that types of stuff. Um, and I think one of the reasons too, like, again, as a Caribbean person that that really connects to me is because I've always felt like the Caribbean has been prime for e-commerce, you know, right. we talk a lot about like, if th- again, you think about the history of the Caribbean, right? You think about what we we are and what we do or what we've done. You know, we, you know, we made sugar and rice and like mm-hmm. all these types of things, right? Like we export and import 
goods and services, right? Even you think about tourism, right? Tourism is an import export. You know what I mean? Like we're importing these people, you know what yes. I mean? And we're kind of giving them our, our services just in a different type of way. Mm-hmm. And for me, e-commerce is such a thing that would be huge if we could really dial into it. Um, not just as individual islands, but like as a collective to try and see, you know, how can we kind of come together and and use this um, this economic power to kind of take over. So, so what Stripe does, um, Stripe takes the approach of uh, a developer first perspective, right? If you think about the world today, like software developers are like are like gold today. Because yeah. again, like the internet is very pervasive. And so we need engineers and people, we need technical folks that can plug into that world and you know enable it for everyone else. Right. So again, like you might be, again, you might be an author or you might be someone that I don't know, maybe you build furniture or do sculptures or does painting. You know what I mean? But now you have to ask the question, oh, how do I set up a website? How do I build a mobile app? How do I, you know, how do I set up my business to be able to send and receive money? But I want to do it. On, in the digital world, like how do I do these things? And this is where mm-hmm. our software developers really kind of come in and help to do those types of things. So Stripe takes a very developer first perspective. I see. Um, how can we make it very easy for developers to enable payment features inside of their applications and then by rights also helping their customers achieve whatever goals it is that they have? Yep. Now, so that's what Stripe does in like, you know, 10 second nutshell kind of thing. If we think about advocacy now, um, Developer advocacy, which is a position that, that I've held for a couple of years now, is, you know, I like to think about it as a job of empowerment and a job of teaching. Um, and again, you know, you think about you think about engineers, right? Engin- engineers are stereotypically very introverted people. We don't, you know, I don't think most of us come out and say, oh, I want to be a teacher. I want to go teach math or science or whatever the case is. But I, I noticed for most of us, you know, as we kind of progress through our careers and when we get to a point where we're not just the, the mentees, but we become the mentors, right? Like we have to impart our years of knowledge on people. You know, you get into this mindset of, hey, I need to share this and I need to teach it to other people. Um, one, not just to tell them how to do things, but also tell them the things that failed for us, right? Like what are the mistakes that we made mm. and kind of pass on that history? You know what I mean? And I think, again, when you think about like engineering history, you know, no one's really telling that story, right? Like at least not, not yet. And so developer advocates for me are, are those folks that, you know, they, they tell the story, but they also teach, they empower, um, and they make sure that, you know, folks that are building their next business or, you know, working for whatever company or, you know, building cloud and mobile apps and those types of things have the tools and the knowledge that they need to be able to be successful. Um, so again, if you, if you look across different companies, right. Cause almost most companies have an advocacy team in some incarnation. Yes. You think about companies like MongoDB or Twilio or, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, their job is to go out and, you know, find out, well, what are the things that their community needs, their customers need? Um, but again, not just from a sales perspective, but from a, Hey, like, what are the problems that you really have? Like, how are we making things harder or easier for you? And then kind of bring that back inside, bring that internal feedback and kind of work with the teams, the engineering teams, the planning, things of that nature. So folks could understand, okay, well, we need to prioritize this as we're going through our, um, you know, our, our development cycles. And then once those things are ready, now we can come back out and be like, hey, well, let me share with you the things that we've built for you. And let me mm-hmm. show you how the decisions that we've made are shaping technology for the future and are going to help you build apps easier, faster, more, you know, in a more secure way, in a more stable way. Great. And I think before I had met you back at the conference, you know, we just kind of went to school together and yeah, yeah. We, we sort of linked up at a conference and you tell me about developer advocacy. I was like, what, what the hell is this man talking about? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I could go to a conference and talk to people and help people build things, but I'm not necessarily a software engineer. On an engineering yeah. team, just cranking away code, never speaking to people. So yeah. I, I think for for folks that have that extrovert like personality, but you still want to do tech, uh, develop advocacy is quite an interesting role. And yeah. so we do the show to encourage people from the Caribbean region to pursue what we're going to call data driven careers. And the show is called Caribbean Data Science Podcast, but one of my intentions is to remind everyone that um, you said 
you know, bend the machine to my will. And, and something that resonated from the fact that we can't do machine learning without all of the software engineering under the hood, right? We sure. just, without that data infrastructure, data flowing, um, serving all our, our models to make all these cool decisions. Yeah. So what do you think the, the role of tech and machine learning has to play in, in the Caribbean's future? And, and what should people listening both from all the way as teenagers up to professionals now, because yeah. in different shapes and forms, they'll be affected. Yeah, what are your thoughts on the outlook? Sure, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you like a very abstract answer to that question. Okay. Um, I think every step in my life has been about perspective. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like when I was in Antigua and I was building um, a vision for what the future looked like, Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was based on the things that I saw around me, you know what I mean? And so at the time, so we're, we're talking 99, 98, right? Okay. Um, people at home that I saw that were doing anything with computing mm -hmm. was like fixing printers and running <laughs> cable and you know what I mean? Like, like that's what they were doing. You know what yes. I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, the, the printer break and my parents called the guy on the phone, he come and he do what he do. And you know, that's, so from my perspective, that's what computing was. It was mm. people plugging in cables and, you know what I mean, like fixing printers. And again, at the time in 99, like that was exciting. It was new and it was, it was different for me because that's, you know, like we didn't grow. I didn't grow up with computers in high school. I didn't have that. So, right. so this is still a new and interesting thing for me. And now you kind of fast forward today, you know, as you kind of see where computers have gone, you know what I mean? And I've kind of gone along that journey, right? So like I left Antigua and I, I, I come to Florida Tech in Florida. And, and not only am I exposed to the full capability of the industry, but I'm also meeting different people, Yes. right? The, the reason that, that that story is important is because it's about perspective, right? Because now I have a different perspective about what the capability of the machine is. Hmm. You know what I mean? Now I'm understanding, oh, okay, well, I don't have to just plug in cables and fix printers. I could do something different, right? And then, you know, I think about after I graduate and I move into that professional world, again, I'm making another transition. I'm getting perspective, right? Like, I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, well, this is how people outside of academia are actually build, like practically building and pragmatically putting solutions together and solving problems. And, you know, I think about going even further past that, you know, I was able and I've been blessed to be in a position where, you know, software and technology is taking me all, all over the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Software is taking me to Africa. It's taking me to Amsterdam. I've been to Mexico and like all over the globe, right? Again, perspective. And I'm saying that not because, you know, I want to tell people I, I travel a lot, but I tell that because a lot of the times when we look at technology, we look at the career, we don't really understand what the capability is. Hmm. I never thought when I left Antigua that I would be eventually traveling the world doing computing, right? I thought I was going to be plugging in cables at home. And, and now as you, you kind of go through life and you see different things, um, you're able to understand like that the picture is bigger than you realize, right? And so again, I'm, I'm telling this, this long story because for folks in the Caribbean, it's, it's very important for us to just look beyond what's inside of our bubble. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean? like I said earlier, when this conversation, I think the Caribbean is prime for e-commerce, right? And e-commerce, not just within the region, but across the world, right? Right. Like that is a bigger picture, you know what I mean? Versus like me selling you, you know, I don't know, whatever I'm selling you and you live down the street, right? Like I'm talking about worldwide economic empowerment. Yes. And I think that's, that's the way that we kind of have to start looking at things. Um, you know, I think about like other things that we've exported out of the Caribbean, that mm -hmm. we really don't get credit for. I think about like our music, for instance. You know, I was I was reading this thing the other day, and dance hall is a multi-billion dollar business. What? Right? Um, across <laughs> the world, right? You, you you look at you know concerts that happen in the UK and in mm -hmm. China, Asia, things of that nature. It's a multi-billion dollar business. I don't know any billion dollar dance hall artists. Right. Right? Again, like we're we're exporting our things, but we don't really always maximize on the potential right like the money doesn't come back to us it goes out and it doesn't come back in yes and so again I'm, I'm talking about like these economic systems because i think there's we need to look at us again as, as caribbean people regardless of whether you live in 
um, the island or not, or your family's from there, or whatever the case is. We need to look at it from a future perspective of, you know, where can we take this going forward? You know what I mean? Maybe, I don't know, maybe you are a party promoter, right? Like mm-hmm. how can how can technology and things like Stripe and the cloud and those types of things empower the services that you're trying to give to your customers, right? And again, your customers are not just the people that are in the country trying to buy your ticket. Your customers are the tourists that are planning months in advance that are right. like, yo, Trinidad Carnival in February, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to walk, right? Yeah. Where are we going? Oh, let me go and pull up this app. Let me go and pull up Mark's app and let me see all of the different events that are there. Let me go and prepay, you know what I mean, with whatever mechanism that I have. Let me go ahead and reserve my things ahead of time, you know what I mean? But then we have to be able to enable them with that experience and that quality mm-hmm. of service. And so that's where that's where technology comes in, right? Again, being able to look beyond like our bubble or what we think is good enough, right? Like let's let's extend beyond that and like look at a more global scale to try and understand. So for people that in, in the islands now that are thinking about technology and thinking about, um, you know, how can I get involved and what can I do? You know, just, just think about whatever it is that you're doing today. You know, there's always a bigger, there's always a bigger play, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so just start with the things that you think are important and helpful. And then kind of grow beyond that, right? And, I, and I'll also add to that too. You know, I know a lot of folks that are in tech that don't have technology degrees, that don't have formal training. You know, a lot of my coworkers well, in, in a previous job um, had degrees in biology and psychology and literature and all these types of things. And they were some of the most impactful people when it came to making decisions for software. Because mm. again, it's about perspective, right? I'm always going to go back to that perspective. And the reason that's important is because we need people that have these different mindsets and these different visions about how the world works to kind of come together and help us make a solution. Because if, you know, if we treated it like, you know, like, uh, like the government, right. And like only certain people can make decisions, (laughs) then, you know, the world's only going to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we have to be able to open it up a little bit and have all of our opinions there. And again, you probably, you know, and again, you're, you're a data science person, so you probably understand the importance of having data, right? And, and data, not just in terms of like, you know, hard drives of information, mm-hmm. but also the data that's inside of your brain, right? Like the, the perspective that's going to help you make the decisions or share the opinions that are going to shape the way that we kind of look at the future of the world and, and technology and, and how we apply it to the region. Absolutely. I wanted to piggyback off your, your perspective thread. And I think as a data scientist, you're watching all the robotics, you're watching how different machine learning models learn to mimic the decisions that human make, humans make, sorry. I think the perspective that each of us have within our domain of expertise, also within our lives, within our regions, I think will come into a greater play in terms of how you advance in your career, how you sort of contribute to the economy and, you know, different different types of algorithms and robots will will handle certain things for us in the future to some degree and it might be probably as much of that in the caribbean when it comes to you know hardcore hardware coming there first naturally it, it always kind of starts maybe in the us or the big centers and and trickles down but that's something interesting to uh, to keep an eye on and and once again i, I kind of come back to i like the perspective angle because before I met you at that conference, you know, I'd known you for so many years, my dad had a computer company growing up. So from 10 years old, and and you talk about plugging in things. And that's what I also saw computing as not necessarily the programming aspect and building games or or building just programs and building infrastructure on top of this hardware. Mm -hmm. And now that as I've gotten older and, you know, you try to go make money and all this kind of stuff, you, you respect, um, is that particular beginning of computing and yeah. that was the the big thing back then but now computing is sort of democratized and how can we now up level our own skill to a world level on, on the software level machine learning level etc so yeah. that was cool so in the first part of the show we try to dive into your career journey so you mentioned at this point you are leading developer advocacy at, at stripe and well, I'm we'll, not leading it. I'm not leading it. Well, you're not leading it, but, but you know, we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. 
cool. I didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't want to get in trouble. trouble. I just got here. <laughs> no, no, yeah, cool, man, yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, just reference. Okay, yeah. but he's at yeah, Stripe yeah. Um, doing developer advocacy. Also, yeah. if you want a job, you know, reach out to him mm. as well. And so you've kind of told us where you grew up. You grew up in in Antigua. Yeah, kind of give us a an understanding of why you chose computing. Like, did someone introduce you to it? Did you always have that affinity? And and the main reason I ask that question is. Um, twofold one for folks that know exactly what they want to do you seem like that type of person to some degree yeah. and you know what's the perspective for others who may not know what they kind of want to do yeah um so kind of going back to me being in high school at home um because i think just before i was like starting to apply for colleges this is when i'm like the year before is when i'm trying to figure out well what exactly am i supposed to be doing like what's what's the you know like what's the point like what are we yep. doing here and for a long time, I was really interested in studying people and understanding okay. like how they work. When I say that, like, like from a psych- psychological perspective, like I want to do psychology. Um, I wanted to do be- behavioral psychology and kind of understand, um, you know, like, like from an emotional perspective, like why do people behave the way that they do, you know, understanding habits and traits and like all these types of like that type of stuff was always very interesting for me. Um, and it's and it still is to this day, but like I wanted to do that as a profession. Now, again, like we're talking about like Antigua in the 90s, right? Hmm. Um, you couldn't, as a Caribbean child, say you wanted to do psychology because the first thing that your parents tell you is that you're going to go work in a crazy house, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that nobody, <laughs> no self respecting person wants to go work in a crazy house. You could be the crazy doctor, and you know, people could be saying all kind of things about you. My father said, yo, we're not doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? yep. so, so then that was the end of that conversation. So I was like, man, well, yeah, I had to figure something else out. Like, what else am I going to do? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, if you remember, I told you, I didn't, I didn't grow up with computers, right? Like, I went to the high school. You know, the year I left high school, um, a home, a secondary school, um, that's the year that they brought in a computer lab. You know, it's okay. just like, I walk in out of fifth form, and all of a sudden, <laughs> these computers appear, right? Mm. But luckily, so my, my father used to have to write reports and all these types of things. So, I, you know, I grew up with him being on a typewriter for okay. many, many years. And then eventually Whoa. he was like, yeah, I need to get a computer because this typewriter thing, you know. Yeah, they were I mean, yeah, we, yeah, we had to do something different. So, um, and that's when, too, when you bought computers back then, like it came with everything. You're like, mm-hmm. no, you buy a computer, it just come with like the tower and it don't come yeah. with the rest of it. <laughs> like those days when you say I buy a computer, it come with... The monitor, the keyboard, the mouse, it come the printer come with it. it mouse come with, pad. Yeah, everything. it come with everything. Like you just have to open the box and plug it in, right? You don't have to buy a piece of this and piece of that. So anyway, he bought a computer. He was it was a compact presario. I don't know if y'all remember compacts, but you know, this is how old it was. Compact presario. And um, that was like that was his report machine. You know what I mean? So yep. when I say that, I mean I couldn't touch it, I couldn't eat by the table. You know what I mean? Like the children cannot touch the machine. This is like a serious big people thing. You know what I mean? Ooh. Can't touch it. Mm-hmm. And so when he'd go to bed, like I'd wake up <laughs> and I'd be on the computer. Right. And I was, and you know, you know, we, what, what, what are we doing? Right? We're playing solitaire and minesweeper and you know, that's what we're doing. Right. And so eventually it got to the point, like after a couple of years that I got better at the computer than he did. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, cause eventually, you know, like, like once, once the novelty of the new thing wears off, then you start, you know, your parents start to ease up a little bit. Yes. And so I started to play like video games and stuff. Like, um, I think like this one video games was on a CD, you put in the CD, you install it. Mm-hmm. You had to go to like the, the, the DOS prompt and type install, you know what I mean? To install the game and stuff <laughs> like that. So I was playing this game and I can't remember something happened. And then I ended up having to fix it. And so I ended up like navigating through the C drive and clicking all kind of stuff. Cause I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out. Right. I'm like, you know, if, if this guy can come in and plug in things and I've been watching this guy come and plug in cables for years now, I must okay. be able to do this. Cause I, I watch him do this enough. Mm. And so anyway, at, at one point now uh, I decided to pick up one of the books. Cause again, you buy the computer, the computer come with a bunch of books. Right. And as I'm kind of navigating through the books, trying to figure out how to fix this thing. I found a book about, um, the internet, right? And it was Netscape Navigator and HTML. Mm-hmm. So I wrote my first lines of HTML one summer 
And it was, it was, you know, if you think about it today, it's very trivial, right? I literally just put my name in the middle of the screen. That was all it was. And, but at the time, again, we're talking 97, 98, whatever it was. Damn. At the time, I was like, yo, this is magic. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I called my partners in the phone. I'm like, yo, 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 you need to come to the house. <laughs> yeah, I just put my name on the computer. I was like, yo, if you come over, I can put your name on the computer to watch it. Bad, right? Because. Cause I'm excited. You know what I mean? Like you just, you, it's like, you mm-hmm. learn, like you learn a new thing and you're excited about it, you know? And I, and I can imagine that's a similar way how people that are learning today feel, right? Like if mm-hmm. they, like you, you, you unlocked an achievement and you excited, you want to share it with people. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So, so anyway, at that point I was like, well, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Right. Like I kind of want to, I kind of want to, I want to dive into that feeling of achievements, like unlocking achievements Yes. through this machine and trying to figure that out. Um, but again, at the time, you know, the examples that I saw around me weren't around programming, but they're around like fixing things, you know yes. what I mean? And so, so my head was like, oh, I'm going to come and learn how to fix things. Mm-hmm. And um, so even though I decided, Hey, I want to do computer science as a, like when I'm studying in university, I still didn't know what I was going to do. Right. Okay. Cause I mean, I, I assume at some point, like I have to do more than just plugging cables. So, but, mm-hmm. and, and I didn't know, I didn't, again, I didn't have perspective. I didn't know anything else. Right. You know, and again, it's only after coming to Florida and going to Florida tech where I was like, oh, okay. I can do all these other things. Mm-hmm. Like, this is interesting. Um, and then now I kind of started to, you know, go into career fairs and, you know, um, I was in the um, ACM, ACM, I'm sorry, Associated for Association for Computing Machines. Yes. And I was in like IEEE and Nesby and, you know, all them, all them kind of things. Uh, and then because, the Caribbean Students Association group too. Yeah. Caribbean Associates. Yeah. But again, all that, all that was really just about perspective at the end of the day. I see. Like at the time I didn't see that, but like now as an older person, like I could look back in time and be like, you know, that's really what I was looking for. I was looking for mm. perspective. Like I was trying to understand the world that I was trying to break into and understand like what's, what's possible. Mm-hmm. And so Again, I think it was that moment when I put my name on the screen in Antigua the first time, and then coming to Florida Tech and understanding some of what's possible for me was just like, okay, well, this is it. Like, this is what we're doing. You know okay. what I mean? And Makes then sense. that kind of just kind of pro- propelled me forward from, from that point. Great. And, and tell us about, I think at least for those that are listening at home, probably choosing a school. And, and for those in the audience who already went to school and yeah, you know, you're yeah. working and all that, you know, bear, bear with us, but I think it's important to highlight maybe why you went to a smaller school versus a bigger school. And yeah. how was your sort of mindset when you entered Florida Tech as a smaller school? And, and at least from my perspective, I've always had in my head how people brand themselves. I've always kind of watched how, how people do that in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. In addition, you know, when you come from a Harvard and a Yale, the yeah, progression yeah. Of, of different brands like that versus mm-hmm. people from a smaller school or from a smaller region. Mm-hmm. So, so tell us some, some thoughts around that. Sure. So I would tell you, um, so like being in Antigua, I think it's, it's different or just any island in the Caribbean at the time, it was different when you're looking for schools because I never went on a school tour. You know, you know, mm. some people just go on tours and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so you, never went to a school, okay. you travel and you know, oh, let me go into this open house and that house. I never had none of that, right? Okay. What, what happened one year? My uncle, because my my uncle travels a lot for work. Mm. Uh, he traveled a lot for work at the time, and so on one of his trips back home, he brought me this thick book, and it was like U.S. colleges and universities. You might remember that book. The book yeah. was like thousands of pages thick. Mm-hmm. Right. It talked about different schools. It talked about things to do in the area. It broke down the individual programs, yep. G, um, requirement, GPA requirements, SAT deadlines, like whatever information it was in a book. Right. This like we didn't go on the Internet for just look for this stuff. Right. It was a big, thick book. And so I had the book now and I'm thinking, well, I mean, I've been to the United States to visit people, you know, like a week or two, but I've never lived there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, you know, my perspective of college in the United States was like BET at MTV on TV. You know what I mean? Again, just being honest, like perspective, yeah. right? Like that's all mm-hmm. I know. And so this is what I'm, ex- I'm, what I think the world looks like from a college perspective. And um, so I was like, well, I don't really know this place. So I'm going to pick 
um, cities and states that I have family that lives at least close by. Okay, right? makes sense. So okay. I picked Florida because you know I have some some family at the time that was scattered throughout Florida, mm-hmm. um, Virginia, and then I think I picked New York. Um, and I, I so I specifically now after I picked those three states, I'm starting to look at good computer science schools in those states, mm-hmm. right? So obviously Florida Tech was a good one. I applied to Florida Tech. I applied to UCF. Um, I applied to Virginia Tech um, and a couple other ones. I can't remember. But anyway, I got into Florida Tech. I got into Virginia Tech. And so now it was, okay, am I going to go to Florida or am I going to go to Virginia, right? Yeah. Um, I think at the time, either one of them would have been a good choice. You know, back then and even now, I think either, either one of them were pretty good choices for like the path I wanted to take. Um, what was important for me at Florida Tech and the deciding factor was one, Florida was closer to home. So yes. in case I didn't like it and I was ready to bounce, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Again, in my head, you know, it wasn't a big deal. Like I could do that. You know, now in retrospect, like plane travel is not that serious. But again, at the time, like, yeah, I'm not trying to, you know, be standing on no, no plane for too long. I just want to, you know, I just want, if I, when I'm ready to go, I want to go. <laughs> right. And, and then also to the fact that Florida Tech specifically had the highest international school, uh, international student population mm-hmm. at the mm-hmm. time. I don't know what it is today, but like at the time, I think they were at like 11% international wow. students, which is like a big number for mm-hmm. the United States. So I'm like, okay, cool. I, I, I want to go there because I don't want to be like the only outsider. Right. Um, and then I think after all, my mother had mentioned she knew um, some other Antiguans that were there. They okay. were they were years ahead of me, but like, you know, she knew other people that were there. So I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, well, that, that sounds like a comfortable space for me to, to go to. So, so that's how I ended up doing that. Um, so it wasn't about how big the school was or um, anything like that. But for me, it was really about where could I go and I was going to feel comfortable Mm-hmm. And you had that support Just, system around you to yeah, having a support system. Obviously, you know, I from the from the um, from the beginning, I applied to schools that had good reputations in computer science, mm-hmm. right? So like that was already sorted out. But like now, in terms of making the choice, it was well, which one of these places am I going to be the most comfortable studying at? Um, that makes sense. And then so I ended up at Florida Tech, and again, yeah, like you mentioned before, like so I ended up joining the Caribbean Students Association and. And, and again, seeking places that would make me comfortable, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So I wouldn't feel as much of an outsider. And I think that was important too, because, you know, one of the things I always tell people is like, you have to be comfortable. Um, and then when you're com- um, comfort breeds confidence, you know what I mean? Okay. If you're not comfortable, you're not going to be confident. And if I'm not mm-hmm. confident, I'm not going to do my best work. You know what I mean? Like yes. you need confidence to do your job. Right. If your job is a student, you know what I mean. You need to be comfortable and be confident that hey, I'm going to be able to walk into this test with confidence. I'm going to be able to do this presentation with confidence. I'm going to be able to write my thesis or whatever with confidence. Right. Yes. And and that confidence not only just comes from academic excellence, it also comes from like the environment that you're in. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the relationships you have with people. The you know, you playing football, we playing basketball, or you know what I mean? Like. Like you have to, you have to find balance in life. You're a whole person, essentially, not just yeah. a particular task. You're up to yeah, life. you have to, you have to find balance in life, right? And so mm-hmm. all of those things are things you should think about, like as you're, not only as you're applying to go to a place, but then choosing how am I going to behave when I'm here, yes. right? Because, because I've spoken to other folks that have done um, alternative strategies where they've kind of come in and they've been like, Oh, I'm not talking to nobody. I can just go to my room and study and ray, 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 whatever. Yeah. And a lot of the times now they look back at those moments with regret. Um, mm. Because when you think about it, right? Like not only do you have to be, again, as a professional, not only do you have to be technically or just from a knowledge perspective, sharp and ready to go, but then, you know, a lot of the things that we do, a lot of opportunities that we get are because of people that we know. Yes. You know what I mean? So let, 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 let's look at this conversation that me and you are having right here <laughs> at this moment. If I didn't know you and you didn't know me, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And and if if we didn't know each other, right, then you would have been like, oh, okay, well, how am I going to 
Like, who am I going to have as a guest on my show? Or who yes. am I going to do this? Like, you're going you're gonna to try and fill these holes with other things mm-hmm. versus being like, oh, yeah, I can just go ask my, my friends. Like, yes. my friends will support me in the things mm-hmm. that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, even when I started speaking, when I started public speaking, you know, it was people that I knew that were like, oh, hey, well, you should do this. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you, should, you should do this thing. You know what I mean? Or every job that I've gotten, every job that I've gotten is because of somebody that I knew every wow. single one. You know what I mean? I have never gotten a job from a recruiter. Um, I've spoken to a lot of recruiters and they've given mm-hmm. me a lot of interviews. Yes. A recruiter has never gotten me a job. So that's, that's a, that's a different thing to talk about. I've gotten mm-hmm. interviews. They've never gotten me a job. Mm-hmm. Every job that I've gotten, I could point to a person that I've known before the fact that has been like, Oh, Cecil can do this. Yes. Cecil can do that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so again, going back to going back to my original point, you know what I mean? It's not only just okay for you to be academically and technically sound, you know what I mean? But again, you have to be a balanced individual, right? Like you got to be able to have conversations with people like a regular person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You have to be able to, to navigate the world. Um, and sometimes like shut off that part of your brain that is like deeply logical. You know what I mean? And then just kind of like experience life to understand, again, perspective, right? And there's perspective of other people and see how you can kind of tie those two things together. Great. And so one of the things I wanted to to re-highlight in in what you just shared there is, you know, if we didn't know each other and to some degree we knew each other by, you know, just being from the Caribbean or assessed from the Caribbean. Cool. And I always kept that in my head. However, I think only until I, I met you at the conference after you graduated and you're like, hey, you know, you could kind of talk to people and do technical stuff. You should consider this particular position. And and you kind of blew my mind when I was like, oh, I travel to conferences, write code, talk to people. Yeah. And you giving me that perspective got my mind going about, hey, maybe my strength is not necessarily only sitting down coding in a room as a data scientist, but more so reaching out to people and connecting people and, and discussing different things. And I'm leaning a lot more into that over time. However, I, I, I always remember like my advisor would just tell me, Hey, remember the managers get fired first and the non-technical <laughs> people tend to get fired first. Yeah. So I think that that kind of runs, runs in my head at the same time, but, but thanks yeah. for sharing that. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a balanced thing, right? It's mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. like everyone can't do everything. You know what I mean? Yes. So everyone can't be on stage or on the microphone or whatever the case is, right? Mm-hmm. But if you know you can, you almost owe it to yourself and then the people around you for you to exercise that muscle. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I can tell you my first day standing on stage on a conference, I was terrified. You know what I mean? I'm just mm-hmm. like, yeah, why do these people put me on this stage? All these people, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't want to do this. But then you do it and then... It's, it's what happens after that brings value to you, right? Mm-hmm. So, so the value to everybody is you being on stage and sharing information. The value to yourself is what happens after the fact. Mm-hmm. And after the fact is people coming up to you and either offering you opportunities, you know what I'm saying? Like sharing, um, sharing their stories and just, again, letting you know about, you know, how much you help them, how much you know, you changed your life and all these types of things, right? And all of that kind of goes into your head in a very emotional way. So this is where the psychology part comes in, right? Cause I'm I still see. very into this, the psychology of it. Mm-hmm. After you're done, like you get, like I, they like to call it the speaker high. The speaker okay. high hits you because of the energy you get from everybody else. And then now, you know, you look at that and you're just like, okay, well, in that moment you can decide, well, is this something that I could do or not? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And when you make that choice, and I, and I say this to us, all of us as Caribbean people, you know what I mean? You are now the leader, right? Yes. Like whether you ask for it or not, you are by default the leader because mm-hmm. you are on stage or on the microphone, like we're talking right now, yes. you know what I mean? And everyone else is kind of sitting back, you know, drinking the water or the coffee or whatever. And they're like consuming everything that we're saying. Mm-hmm. And so by default now, you know, we're, we're, we're forcing people emotionally to think about what we're saying. Yes. You know what I mean? And so now 
if you always keep that in the back of your head, you have to, to think about, well, if I have this power, quote unquote, the superpower, mm -hmm. how can I use that in a positive way to like, I don't want to use power again, but like to influence people in a good way. Yes. Right. Like, like how can I, like you doing this podcast, right? Like you are a leader, right? Yeah, 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 you might not yeah. have asked for it, but you, right. you have, you have a whole show with, I'm looking at your YouTube. You have tons of episodes here. You mm -hmm. are a leader. Like you have accepted that role, whether you ask for it or not. Yes. And now your job is to speak to people, to share stories and to let mm -hmm. folks know, well, this is what's possible, right? Like you're giving perspective. Yes. You know what I mean? Like your people aren't, aren't seeking it themselves. They come to your show so you could give it to them. And I yep. think, again, that's one of the th things that as Caribbean people, we need to do, right? We need to seek out our leaders. We need to mm -hmm. develop new leaders and our leaders need to accept the job. Huh. You know what that's I mean? An, like it has, like to come, it has to come, it has to come from both sides, right? Like we have to seek mm -hmm. them out and then they have to accept it. Um, which is why I'm saying, again, again, so going back now, you think about advocacy, you think about, mm -hmm. you know, choosing the roles you go into and choosing everything. It all comes back down to, you know, what am I really trying to do here? Yes. You know what I mean? Like, and is it for me or is it for everyone else? Um, mm -hmm. Like one of the things I like to say, and this might sound like a roundabout story, but at the end of it, what I always like to tell people is, you know, computers are dumb machines. Like computers are like the mm -hmm. dumbest things in the world. And they're dumb because all they their sole job is to follow orders. Yes. Right? They don't, as much as we talk about AI and the Terminator and the Matrix and whatever, whatever, computers only do what we tell them to do. Right. So then that means that the true inspiration and the guidance comes from us. That means like the leadership comes from us. Right. Hmm. And so as we kind of look at advancing our future and empowering each other. You know, as much as we say, oh man, these computers are hard and complicated and whatever, whatever. And I'm like, not really. Like they're pretty stupid machines. You know what I'm saying? Like if I don't, if I don't type a line of code, like it doesn't do anything. It just sits there and just sucks power out of the wall. Mm -hmm. It literally does nothing. Right. And so now again, we have to, again, from a very psychological perspective, we have to accept that role of leadership and try and figure out, well, okay, well, if we are the leaders both of ourselves and of this digital world that we're creating, um, what do we want to do with that power? Yes. You know what I mean? Like what's, what's, what's the point? And I, and I think what I'm saying is going to make so much more sense when you see things like the metaverse mm -hmm. <laughs> happen and, and we, you know, and I don't, I don't know that it may or may not happen. I know people have tried that a few times before in the past, okay. but assuming that it happens the way that, some of these larger companies are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We have to think about as we walk into that space, like what is what does government look like in the metaverse? In the metaverse. Mm -hmm. What does what does e-commerce look like in the metaverse? What does what is the Caribbean's play in the metaverse in the future? Right? Like, like what what are the opportunities that we have that we can jump on today mm -hmm. um, that maybe we're not thinking about? And we're not thinking about it because we don't yet have the perspective. And what are the, the geographical implications? So for instance, yep. right now you travel in the real world, you're geographically bound, but in this other world, does your government still have control over you when I go to some metaverse in China or in Russia or, or something yep. like that? That, that, was a, uh, that was an interesting point. Um, I wanted to get more into your psychology a little bit and the connections in, in terms of your career journey. So yep. tell us what you were like in, in college, and the reason why I'm, I'm looking at that is I, I'm looking at your LinkedIn, seeing the jumps that you've made. And, you know, as we get closer to talking about how you got to Microsoft through all of the connections yeah. that you made, um, how did you sort of change in your attitude, approach to work as a software engineer, and as you groomed yourself to become a developer advocate? So guide, yeah. us, guide us there. Yeah. Like I said, I think everything is about the balance that you take like throughout your entire life that kind of helps shape you to how you are. When I was in Antigua, I was very, like, I wasn't a talkative person. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, what? You were a talkative uh, person? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't a talkative person. I wasn't into sports as much, you know, like I was, I was a, I was a, I was a fat kid. You know what I mean? I was a, I was oh. a kid that like didn't get picked for, 
to play cricket and you know all them mm. kind of things, right? Like, but what ended up happening, um, and this is again, this is a long story, but the story has a point. What ended up happening is that I ended up sitting on the side with the girls, right? Okay. <laughs> and so you know what ended up happening, I think I became very comfortable just talking to them. Mm-hmm. But you know, conversations with your female friends and conversations with your male friends are very different. Fundamentally you know I mean? different. Not you know, not from a sexual perspective, but they're just they're just different. Like the types mm-hmm. of conversation you have are just not the same. Just that's just what it is. Um, and I think a part of that was important for me to be able to do because now I I saw the world again like just very differently, right? Again, perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Everything goes back mm-hmm. to perspective, and. You know, as I as I kind of saw how they were and how my guy friends were, because now I'm comparing relationships, right? Okay. Even when I was that young, I'm comparing like how things are different between those two sets of people. And this is something I do to this day. Like I like to compare things and understand like why they are the way that they are. Mm-hmm. Um when I when I went into college now, like I chose to be very different, you know what I mean? Because I looked at myself in primary school as being like, I feel like I'm missing out on a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? Like I have a lot and I'm comfortable. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have, you know, family, a lot of family problems and those types of things. Like I had both parents and like, I was fine. Yes. But, uh, but like kind of going into college, I felt like I needed to be different if I was going to like succeed. Mm -hmm. So, which is why, you know, when I got in, like I intentionally forced myself to get involved with a lot of these different clubs and organizations and, and things of that nature. Um, I can tell you, I was a way better student in college than I was in when I did CXCs and, okay, you know, all them kind of things, you know what I mean? Cause you know, I, I was at a point that I just, I didn't really care. I was like, eh, it's whatever, you know what yes. I mean? But then you realize again, like as you transition through different aspects of your life, like you gotta, you gotta figure it out or else you're going to be in trouble. Hmm. And so, like I went through a phase where I had to, I had to just be different, right? Like I had to immerse myself with people. And again, like I said, I always was interested in the way that people behaved. And so I think what better way than just to immerse yourself and with be them. a part of the process, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, instead of being an observer, you know what I mean? Let's be a participant. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know what? I started playing basketball. We played flag football. I was swimming more. I was like, I was doing all the things that I really didn't get to do when I was in primary school, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and even high school when I was in Antigua. The re- again, no, the reason why that's, that's important is because now I, I felt like I was starting to like defy um, what the stereotypical vision of a computer science person is or what an engineer is, mm-hmm. right? So I'll, when I graduated twice, like my friends are just like, dude, like you have a computer science degree? <laughs> You know what I'm yes. saying? I'm like, yeah. Like, you do computer science? I'm like, yeah. Like, what happened? You know, what's the big, mm-hmm. what's the big scene? They're like, you don't look like a computer scientist person. Like, you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just be throwing parties and going out, and you know what I mean? You be going carnival and all kind of thing. And they're like, that's not how computer people behave. Exactly. Yeah. But again, it's it was like, I had I had two goals, right? Like, I had one. I had to psychologically be more interactive. Like I needed to be a different person mm-hmm. or I needed to grow into like a self-sufficient person. You know what I mean? Um, and then too, like I needed, I needed to succeed in my job or my work, right. My job at the time being a student. And so I was doing like two things at the same time in the back of my head, psychologically, I had two things that I was trying to do. You know what I mean? I was trying not to be like that scared, um, self-doubting, child that I was in Mm -hmm. at home. And then two, I was trying to see, well, how far can I take this computer thing? Right. Like, like what can I do with this? Again, perspective. Um, I think the the difference now going from college now to, um, to like being a working professional now in this stage of my life, what I do is like, I mean, cause I, I like to analyze like just behavior. Like I look back at all of the things that I've done throughout my life. And I'm like, you know, I think, you know, they're good and bad aspects of it throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going through and I'm picking the pieces of me that I want to hold on to. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, 
again, it's like you're constantly evolving your mental state, you know what I mean, to to shape who you are. And you know, people like to say the things like you are who you are. Like I'm 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 very much of the opinion of you are the sum of of what you choose to be, which is a little bit different way to think mm. about it. Um and I choose to like pick the good things or like the lessons you've learned or the experiences that you've had and hold on to those. Again, so why, why is this important? Like the same way that I choose to navigate like my personal life is the same way I choose to navigate my professional life. Yes. You know what I mean? And so when people ask me things like, how do I get better at this or that or whatever the case is, I'm like, life is very simple, right? Because we already have the blueprint. You already know what to do. The thing is, you just have to decide whether you want to do it or not, right? So, you know, you think about like the relationships you have with the people that you care about, right? If you care about people, whoever these people are, you will make time to spend with them. Mm -hmm. That's a very simple concept, right? You care about your parents, you will make time to see your parents or call them on the phone or whatever the case is. You care about your spouse, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, you're going to make time to spend with these people, right? Because you want to put in the effort to make sure that that is successful. You yes. know what I mean? Let's flip it now. Let's say we're talking about data science or computer science, or I don't know, maybe you want to do botany, or maybe you want to be a writer, right? How do I become better at my profession? Well, you have to spend the time to do it, right? And not only just in the beginning, but you always have to do it, right? Hmm. Like, if you're someone's child, you always have to spend time with, again, if you want that relationship to flourish, you always have to spend time with your parents or your siblings or whatever the case is. It's not like I'm going it's to do it event. now. Exactly, yeah, I'm, right? I'm not going to do it now and forget about it. And then the next 10 years, I, I don't need to do it anymore and expect the relationship to be the same. Just like in your profession as well. Like I like to tell people to another, another analogy I like to use. If you look at athletes, right? You know, any professional athlete that is good at what they do, practice every day, right? They spend time to do the thing that they care about, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone that's a good writer, you're a good poet, maybe you make movies, whatever it is, you do something, right? You're going to make time to do it, regardless of whether you're being paid for it or not, right? You're going yes. to practice, you're going to read, study, whatever the case is, right? Again, you're going to spend the time to do the things that you care about, right? Psychologically, that's it is what it is. Yes. So now when we look at it from now a technical perspective, us as engineers and people that are, you know, either um, either established in the field or people that are getting into the field or people that are just curious and want to understand, if you want to be good at it, if you want to understand it and learn about it, you have to spend time doing it. So any, yes. if anyone that comes and asks me, hey, how do I become good at something? I'm like, you just have to do it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And obviously, like, it, it, there's, it goes deeper than that. But, like, fundamentally, you have to want to do it. You know, a lot of times we say we want to do things, but we really don't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like, it's like I was, I'll, I'll, I'll give you all a real story. Like, so I was dating this girl a couple of years ago. And she's like, oh, man, like, you work from home. Like, I want to have a job like you. You know what I mean? But like what she's seeing is like years of work allowing me to sit in this room mm -hmm. and stay home and have conversations with people. You know what I mean? Like she didn't see me up on Saturday at two o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning being on call, deploying software and doing this and doing that. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? She didn't see all of that. Right. So I'm like, yo, you I'm like, if you want to get here, like you got 10 years. Yep. You know what I mean? If you want to do what I do, I'm being the position that I'm in. You got 10 years. Right. Um, and again, that's not to deter or to scare anybody. But the fact of the matter is like you have to put in the effort. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like we can't just see like I can't just look at you and be like, yo, Mark Allen books, boy, you got nice headphones. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? The man, you know, clean up and thing. You know what I mean? I want to go do what Mark do. But you don't know that like this guy has a Ph.D. You see what I'm saying? Like Painful. you don't know. You don't know that he's put in the time and the effort to be and sit in the position that he's in today, right? Yes. And you did that because you care about it. It's something you care about, something you believe in, something that somewhere in the back of your brain or in your soul, you're like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Versus being like, oh man, I see Cecil over there. Yeah, let me try that now and see what happens. You know what I mean? Like that's yes. that's not the same thing. And so again, going back to it, like for me, everything in life is very fundamental. Like again, we have the blueprint. We know how this works. You know what I mean? You got to find the thing that you really care about, right? And if you care mm-hmm. about it, you will figure it out. Yes. At oh, some that's, point. A good, that's a good one. Yeah, you. And and I think you mentioning this notion of figuring something out. And as you've hopped different companies and you ended up in Microsoft, seen as a developer advocate, and, and a lot of people know you because yeah. you created a brand with them. When you had kind of started out, I imagine you you didn't necessarily think that you'd get, I don't want to say you didn't think that you would get there. You didn't obviously know how it may evolve yeah. over time. Um, but how did you meet the people that gave you those opportunities? And, and what were one or two criteria that you decided, all right, you know what, it's time for me to leave. And, sure. and when you entered a job, did you... Were there things that you decide, all right, I need to learn X, Y, and Z before I either decide I'm going to leave or try something different? So share share some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a really good question. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the pre and during Microsoft conversation so you can kind of okay. understand the bigger part of the picture. So um at the time, like so I was doing code camps, so like these little mm-hmm. smaller conferences, you know, maybe like a thousand people, whatever. Uh, giving talks about, uh, I think at the time I was doing like web APIs and, you know, web applications and those types of things. That's like the one in Orlando where we met. Yeah. Like the one in Orlando when, when Mm -hmm. me and you had caught up a couple of years ago. And um, so obviously through that, like when you do enough of those things, right. And again, for folks that don't know, like you don't get paid to do this, right. Like you, Hmm. you rent your own hotel, you, you know, drive your own car, buy your own plane ticket and you go to this place to speak. Like they don't pay for you. Yep. And so this was just a thing that I was doing because I liked doing it, right? Like I, again, I cared about it. So I put effort into doing it mm-hmm. um, for, you know, for, for my own reasons. And, you know, it's through that, like I met, a, a, I met tons of folks, right? Like, you know, when you're in Florida and you're going to, you know, you're on the conference circuit, so to speak, eventually you're going to start seeing the same people. Okay. You know what I mean? You're going to start seeing like-minded people that are, care about the same thing that you care about. hmm So obviously like you started to develop relationships and reputations and things of that nature. And I was on social media one day and my, my buddy Shane, so Shane um, uh, lives in Orlando and Shane had posted a message. Hey, we're starting this new team. Um, If you're interested in joining, let me know. And so at the time I was just like, eh, let me message him and see what happened. Right. Like I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking too hard about it. I asked it wasn't even job hunting, but I was like, eh, let me see what happened. Microsoft mm-hmm. job, right? Um, so I, I messaged him, Derek, uh, DM'd him on Twitter. And he's like, hold on, let me have you talk to somebody. And I think that same afternoon, I spent maybe about an hour DMing this dude. Uh, I didn't know who he was. Like, he was one of the managers at the time. Spent about an hour DMing him in and do it, sent him my resume. And like two weeks later, I'm in Seattle. Okay. And, and that was it. Like, that was, it was quick. It was quick. It was short. And, and that was it. Again, I tell that story because... And that's the short version, but I tell that story because it is through my relationship with Shane and through him and us having like that similar mindset and a similar work ethic where I'm like, you know, my friend or my colleague was just like, Cecil could do this. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce you to this person. Right. And then, you know, so now I have the job. So now you have the job and I'm in a new place. One of the things I could tell that was very intimidating for me at that time so us joining the team, the team was very new, right? The team might've been like two months old when I joined. So okay. this, this is very a brand new. new, fresh thing, right? And I'm sitting in the room. We had like a, you know, one of the meetings where they fly everybody in and we all sitting in the room together. And I'm looking around the room and I'm like, I'm seeing people, you know, this person used to work at Amazon. This person worked at Twitter. This person worked at Netflix and NVIDIA and all these big companies. And I'm just like, I just came from Florida. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't have these big technical chops mm-hmm. in my head anyway. That's what I'm thinking, right? I don't have like these big companies on my resume. You know right. what I mean? I don't know how am I supposed to be able to compare to the people that are in this room um, at that time. So I had like that moment of like, I guess, anxiety, right? I guess is mm-hmm. how I, I would describe it. 
And, you know, throughout that week, like I made a decision that week that I had to be like at the end of the day, when this is all said and done, like I had to be the best person in this room, whatever, however you clarify best. Right. Um, You know, maybe not like technically best, because, again, some of these folks have years of experience over me, but like Mm -hmm. nobody is going to outwork me. You know what I mean? And that was that was that was just in my head from the beginning. Like nobody in this room is going to be able to outwork me. Like it's just, it's just not going to happen. And um, one of the things I, I, I did too, right. So, so now we're in the room and, you know, you're meeting your teammates and all this types of stuff. You know, the first thing I'm like, just like I did at Florida tech, you know, let me go and see who are the groups of people that I need to like connect with mm-hmm. outside of my, outside of my bubble. Okay. You yes. know what I mean? Let me look at these different teams and departments and things of that nature. Let me understand what their needs are, what their problem um, problem areas are, and see what can I do in my position to, to help them. The reason why that's important is because now, again, you're at a new company and you have zero clout. These people don't know you mm-hmm. from Adam. You know what I mean? Like they don't owe you nothing. I remember in the beginning, people people never used to answer my emails or... Well, None of that type of stuff. <laughs> well, because you're the new person, right? And so okay, okay. you think about if you have 200 emails, right? And one of your emails comes from somebody that you have no idea who he is or what he's doing. And then you have emails from all of your other colleagues. Like, mm-hmm. which ones are you going to answer first? Fair enough. I mean, that's fair. And I, I didn't take it as a disrespectful way. I just, I mean, that's, that's the way the world functions, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to, again, you're going to put the people that you care about as up a priority. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I mean? So, so now my goal is, okay, well, I need to establish my presence in this company. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, however, however that happens, but in my head, like that's, that's what it is. And, and again, another thing too, and I, this, this also came from Florida tech. Like I'm very low key um, competitive. Okay. You know what I mean? Like I'm not aggressively competitive. Like I'm not going to come and like start cuss you out and thing, but Yo, if if I see yo Mark, yo Mark just did this, I'm like yo, I, I got to top that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Like yo Mark just wrote this this really good article, research paper, whatever. I'm like, oh yeah, all right, I need to write two. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like in the back of my head, that's always how I've been. Again, because nobody's supposed to outwork me. Like you can't you can't do it. It's not gonna happen. All right. Okay. You game on I mean? now. Game on. Yes. Yeah, right, no. Well, that's what it is. And so for me, I find more. And again, it's it's in a friendly way. Like there's no animosity or there's no mm-hmm. negative energy towards anybody. But that's just where I find self motivation. Yes. You know what I mean? Like so, you it's like you show me the limits, mm-hmm. and then I try and break the ceiling. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? And then that's just kind of how I I look at it. And so now my teammates. Again, my teammates were people at the time that were coming from all these different companies, right? So they had information that I didn't know, right? And so once I started to soak up their information, like I just, I'm like, I have to break the ceiling. Like I have Mm -hmm. to push past whatever it is that they're doing, right? And so eventually after, again, I spent four years on the team, four and a half years, you know, that just became normal for me, you know what I mean? Until I got to the point that I was just like, okay, I feel comfortable saying I'm trying not to sound too cocky on this. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I, I, I got comfortable to the point that I'm saying like, I am one of the best people in this room. Okay. Without question. Mm-hmm. And I like, I don't doubt it at all. And it's, it's to the point too, where people on the outside, I want to say the outside, like internally outside, like in different mm-hmm. teams within the company was like, yo, this dude really knows what he's doing. Like he knows what he's talking about. I should answer his email. <laughs> he sends me an email. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Not yes. only, not only I should answer his email, like I should reach out to him directly mm-hmm. and ask him things. Yes. You know what I mean? Because now this is a trusted resource. This is a trusted ally mm-hmm. that I have in, you know, us unlocking, you know, the solutions to whatever problem it is that we're trying to solve. But again, that, that's something that takes years to do and it, it takes consistency, right? Like you can't, you know, you're not going to join a job today and in six months be like, all right, cool. Like I have asserted dominance over <laughs> all I see, right? Yes. It's going to be one of those, hey, this is something that I have to commit to, right? So again, going back to the psychology of like, do you care about this or not? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I care about being the best. <laughs> you know that's, I mean? that's kind I, of what- I care huh. about it. So because I care about it, I'm going to put in the time and effort to do that. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, a lot of times people are like, Cecil, it's Saturday. Why are you, you know, why are you, day. why are you recording? Why are you recording videos and podcasts? Why are you, mm-hmm. you know, creating content? Why are you doing this thing? I'm just like, what else am I going to do? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like while you're sleeping, I'm working. One of the things that I want to highlight, actually, a couple of things that you you said in there. And I think for, this is kind of like my first experience in a bigger, like well-established tech company. So mm-hmm. my jobs, I worked in a railroad company. Okay, it's a, a big company, but it's a railroad company. Really very, yeah. very different pace of innovation or, mm-hmm. or just, you know, working. Then I worked in a startup. So about 200 and something people. So yeah. you got to much much easily or easier discover who are the players in the company and what you can do as you're saying to earn a reputation with them such that you can get different things done across the business. And I guess it's nice to see that as you entered Microsoft, uh, there was this clear notion of, okay, this is my bubble. Microsoft is this ginormous thing. Um, And you start expanding out driven by, Hey, I need to be the best in this room to, um, just that's just your your credo and and from there you establish a reputation to some degree microsoft wide which i think is quite cool in addition to the position that you were in you're in the public marketplace you know tons of people outside of microsoft know you that can also help whisper back inside hey um, this is the guy for the job or girl or whatever the case may be yeah yeah. um and i i I think it's important those are things you shit you don't learn in school uh, study your classes, you get a job and, and everything will be okay. Whereas I think what what I'm enjoying about you highlighting is you becoming really good technically has a big fundamental component of the people that you end up interacting with along the way, it seems like. And any, yeah. any thoughts there? Yeah, like going back to like those long stories I was telling in the beginning about how I psychologically approached being a different person going into college. And then Mm -hmm. after college, like looking back and like picking up those components that make sense. It has a lot to do with that, right? Like, again, about becoming like a whole person and not just like a book smart academic, you know what I mean? Like you kind of look at it from, you know, what are like, what are really the components to success? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like are the smartest people in the world, the most successful people in the world? You know what I mean? Like I'd argue Mm -hmm. most of the folks that at least that I see examples of college dropouts, (laughs) you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, People that didn't graduate high school, but people that had the confidence to like make a bet on themselves. Yep. Right. And make a bet on, you know, I have these resources, like how can I best use them to, to create something different and special? And again, like I want to break the ceiling, you know what I mean? Um, I think a lot of the times that we get very used to like whatever, whatever culture. Mm-hmm. And I, when, I, when I talk about culture, right. Not just like Caribbean culture, but culture is, is, you know, the thing that defines behavior. Right. And so when you think about it from that way, <clears throat> what are the things that we've just kind of accepted as default and never really challenge? Yes. And, and now, like, should I challenge it? Can I challenge it? Like, like, mm-hmm. how do we pick the right things to challenge? Or how do I decide I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit back and take it, right? And I'm just going to accept it for what it is. And, you know, it's the people that really challenge culture are the people that move it forward, right? Again, so we're thinking about technology. Like, you think about your phone, right? Like, we don't, we don't talk about this, but, you know, your cell phone, your smartphone has changed culture. Yes. It, it changes how we communicate with each other. It mm-hmm. cha- changes how we share information with each other. It changes how we are productive day to day. So by right, it has changed culture, right? Yes. It has changed the way that we listen to music. It has changed the way that we travel. It has changed the way that we, we write things down or whatever. It has changed culture. Mm-hmm. Everyone's culture, not just Caribbean people. Like Everyone's culture is different. And so now it's the people that were able to kind of see that and say, okay, well, I'm going to push past what's normal. And like, we're going to do something different and new. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's, again, that's the kind of way that I like to, to look at things, right? Like, you know, I'm going to pick and choose what I'm comfortable pushing on and, and then not push. pushing on, right? Yep. Because mm-hmm. um, again, everyone's different, right? Like we can't, we, like I can say whatever I want to say on the show, 
because I've done it. Yes. But then, you know, because it works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. You got to figure out in you becoming like a whole person, you know what I mean? And not just like an academic or otherwise, what are the things that you're comfortable doing and being a part of? What are the things that you care about that you're going to put time into, right? And focus on that. And then again, like that's, that's where success comes from, right? Like it's, it's, what's, what's that term? Um, when preparation meets opportunity, right? Like that's yep. success. So there's some term that, that goes like that. There's a, so I wanted to tell a quick story, at least the experience that I had. And mm-hmm. as I'm listening to a lot of the psychology tidbits that you're sharing or the psychology um, frameworks that you're sharing, when I met you at the conference, so mm-hmm. a big part of my success has been volunteering for conferences, completely for free, doing a ton yeah. of work, not expecting anything in return, but ultimately just trying to provide value in addition, excuse me, in return for just having an opportunity to do something. Yeah. And so a friend of mine, I was working in his railroad company. He tells me about this code conference in Orlando. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. But yeah. I decided, all right, let me look into it. Then I see you. So one of the things I want people to walk away with is everyone that you meet is a node in your graph that you should yeah. always keep yeah. in mind. Um, you might have a, a strong connection, a weak connection, but there is some level of connection and, and you always need to keep that in mind. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go. And I don't know if I had, I may have reached out to you before I came to the conference. And Yeah, I think you I, told me you were coming. Yes. Yeah, you told me you were coming. And I was like, okay, well, actually you were the only reason I was going to the conference because there's lots of other things there. I'm like, okay. But just yeah. for the experience as well. So we met and you encouraged me to apply. And I, you know, I went out to Microsoft and on my Microsoft interview story after my master's, I had an interview at Microsoft. I hate school, by the way, like just formal schooling. I don't learn in that environment yeah. very well, but you got to do it um, as an international student. So I get to Microsoft after my master's, have an interview. Another friend from FIT, he was on the interview panel. Uh, it was Dion. And mm-hmm. he was like, hey, you know, he didn't interview me, but he's like, hey, you know, congrats, you're going to get an offer. And, you know, yeah. so I, I'm feeling good. Yeah. I know everybody's going to get offers. Boom. Um, I didn't get an offer. So mm-hmm. everybody else got an offer when it, it, it shook, shook out and I didn't get one. So I went and did my PhD. And one of the guys that interviewed me at Microsoft told me, hey, don't worry. Um, I failed my first interview at Microsoft and I went off, did some work, came back five years later yeah. and, and succeeded. Circa, it, that interview that you got me was five years later. So I, I walked into that Microsoft interview like, Hey, this is just as this guy kind of predicted hmm. coming back to that notion of, Hey, this thing took a lot of time yeah. to, to get to certain places and, and really reminding people to, um, you can't rush it. You don't know when it's going to come. And when I got into the room, I was definitely nervous. I didn't think I had maybe as, as much of the deep learning experience um, just because as a function of the job. And the other thing that I really took away from there was building your brand. And, and, and that was one of the pieces of feedback that I got that, hey, you're, you're, going, you're trying to be a developer advocate. Nobody really knows you in, in the marketplace. What have you written? Yeah. How can we be confident that um, you can educate and convince people to adopt our platform? And, and since then, even though I didn't get into Microsoft, you know, psychologically, you, you feel defeated to some degree, but I was like, you know, you can't give up. And now that I'm at NVIDIA through connections, just like yourself, um, I've I've taken you know a much firmer stance on hey, building your brand, uh, be it whatever it is, uh, especially as a technical person who who can communicate with people is, is super important. So can you guide, share any any advice on building your brand and yeah. um, as a developer advocate, let's say. Yeah, I want to touch on one of the things you said there um, about feeling defeated. Um, so I. I have a philosophy uh, when it comes to dealing with those types of problems, right? And that's like in life, right? Again, whether it's a personal problem or a technical thing, there's two choices you have. You could fix it or you could leave it alone. Hmm. When you think about it, there's really nothing else you could do. I mean, they're like a very binary person, fix it or like that's-, well, that's well, But think about it. I have a problem, right? I'm either going to try to fix it and there might be multiple ways to fix it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. But I'm either going to try to fix it or I'm going to walk away mm-hmm. and I'm going to leave it alone. Either way, 
staying in the middle and choosing um, indecision is dangerous. Hmm. Indecision is dangerous because it wastes time. Yes. And you lose clarity about what you're focusing on. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yes. It's, yes. It's like, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to use you again as an example. Like you yeah. have the show, right? You have this podcast and you could sit in indecision and debate about doing a podcast for years. And people do that. Right. Mm-hmm. I know people that have done that. And one point is like, oh, I'm afraid. I don't know if it's going to be successful. But then two, I can be like, well, you've just sat for two years and you haven't done anything. Yes. So like your brain, you haven't like advanced. You haven't declined, but you haven't advanced either. You're just kind of, it's like, you're just burning electricity. It's like, you know, you go into the bathroom, you turn on the mm-hmm. faucet and you just you have the water it. running. Like, yeah, what are we doing? You're going to use it or you're not going to use it. Like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let's Absolutely. make a decision. Mm-hmm. And so again, like when I, when I think about that thing of feeling defeated, um, what I like to tell people is you have two choices, right? Not, and it's not about fix it or not fix it, but it's about, I could either take that, that feeling, right? Like that, that energy, that psychological energy, mm-hmm. and I could direct it towards me in a positive way, or I could dwell on it and I can have it beat me down. Yep. Right. And so, you know, you kind of have to figure out, well, what do I want to do? And then, you know what? Sometimes you can do both. Sometimes you just need a minute to chill out. Yes. And then clear your head. But at the end of the day, you have to choose, am I going to commit? Do I care mm-hmm. about this? And am I going to kind of commit and try to figure it out? Or am I going to leave it alone and do something else? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because again, any any successful person is going to tell you like that their journey has been littered with failure, right? Yeah, because yeah. failing is a part of figuring it out. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The question is like, how badly do you want to figure it out? You know what about, I mean? Or, what's interesting is, before my interview so and i think this is kind of interesting where music comes in there's a song that i was playing right before mm-hmm. i'm getting driving over to the interview so i'm getting all pumped yeah, yeah. up and i'm like you know what effort I don't, I don't care what's gonna happen i'm just gonna walk in there as my best and wherever i'm at right now that's just the next level that i need to get to and, and that's how i felt in, in the first microsoft interview and i had to go into this in my opinion a drudgery journey of a, of a phd especially mm-hmm. something that you don't want to do um, I think that's an interesting highlight there. You know, you're motivated to do something, but there's this uh, chasm that you have to cross to, to yeah. kind of get to where you want to go. Um, so it's nice that you're kind of pointing out um, that notion of, of, of sort of doing something. And I kind of wanted to share, I'm even starting a different podcast. And that same yeah. thought process of, is this going to work? What am I going to do? Um, is, is coming up again, even though I'm with this one, I'm just like, you know what, let's just go. I presented it to like a group of people. I'm like, you know what? Let's just get started, start interviewing and, and sort of see where it evolves from there. And I've kind of looked at you from afar as, as I've seen you brand yourself um, in the marketplace and, and other people that we know as well. So it's kind of, um, it's very interesting to to think about in your professional career. And, and that's not, like I, I said, something you learn in school. Like how do you brand yourself in this yeah. new world? Um, so as we get closer to, to sort of finishing you shared a lot of advice. I've, I'm taking my my own personal notes. Yeah. And what two pieces of advice would you give to a high schooler, a college student, and a professional, um, given your understanding of, of tech globally, all the different perspectives that you've gotten, uh, that they should keep with them, in both the short term and long term, as it comes to like their future in the Caribbean. Yeah. My my advice would always be. Like, don't be afraid to experiment and explore. And, okay. and I say that because that's one of the things that I would have told myself, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. right? Because again, like at, at that point and, you know, prior to me going to college and whatnot, like I was very timid and I was very afraid of exploring and I was very afraid of failing. Because, you know, like you, you fail at stuff as a child mm-hmm. and it, I feel like it hits you harder as a child than it does when you're older because you're not like, as mentally secure mm. in your um, in, like in your level of confidence. Yes. But I think I would tell anyone that's in, the, in high school or primary school or whatever the case, wherever you are in your career, it's really just about trying to explore and understand things and just know that there's going to be a lot of things that break and don't work and 
don't fit the right way or you just don't understand or you're going to hear people use language and jargon that just that sound like a different language you know what mm-hmm. i mean and you're not going to know mm-hmm. what it is and uh, honestly like if again if it's something that you care about like you're going to stick with it and um just have the discipline to figure it out um like I, like i like i keep saying throughout this this conversation you know, if you care about something, like you're going to make the time for it. And a part of that is having discipline. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, oh, this is, this is not another conversation we can get into another day, but you know, it is important for us to understand the importance of discipline. You know what I'm saying? Like if you, I've never been in the army or the military or anything like that, but like, I, I look at those things again, from a psychological perspective and I study them sometimes Yes. to be like, you know, the mission is important, right? Mm-hmm. Regardless of whether you, you know, are the best soldier or not, or whatever the case is, the fact is like, we're on a team and we have a mission and I'm going to do my parts to achieve that mission. Yes. Your team, like your army might be like your family or mm-hmm. your coworkers or whatever the case is, right? And, you know, everyone's not going to succeed. Everyone's not going to, maybe not succeed at the same time or maybe not succeed at the same things, but collectively we can come together. We could create something special. We could do something important. I see. And so the important part is like being able to have the discipline to understand like what's the bigger picture mm-hmm. and then commit to what you're doing. Right. Like if you, if you have a family, right. Again, your family is not the military, but if you have a family, like you, you need to have the discipline to commit to your family. Right. Cause you, you wanted them, right? Like you wanted mm-hmm. spouse, children, dog and white picket fence and all that stuff. Like if you want it, you have to be able to commit to do the work to have it. Right. And yes. we all know relationships are hard mm-hmm. and you know, if you don't put in the work, like it's not going to work out. Yes. You know what I mean? So again, like going back, I think people need to figure out, and experiment, particularly younger folks, just experiment and try to understand well, what do I want to do? And then after you see like a clear picture or a, a picture that's clearer than what you had before, because picture is mm-hmm. never really clear. Because pictures always change. Right. Again, from a psychological perspective, um, you know, commit with the discipline to say, I'm going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And a part of that too, is not even just saying like, you know, I'm not saying figure it out by yourself either right because i think that's that's an important thing to talk about it's not about figuring out by yourself it's just about figuring out period whether that's going on online or on your phone or or asking somebody or even just just talking to someone listening to podcasts reading books watching documentaries like whatever it is that you need to do like seek knowledge from people that have it and have gone through it and Mm -hmm. then now you paint your own picture based on like the, the collection of things that you've gotten from these different people. Yes. And so again, you do the exploration, you figure it out, you commit to it. And then now, and again, the important part, I think, particularly for us as Caribbean people, now we have to accept the role of leaders. Hmm. You know what I mean? And then leaders doesn't mean that we're in control, but yes. leaders just means that we're in a position to guide and to- hmm. And you have a big um, responsibility impart advice or, or, you know, just be able to share information to help you do better than I did. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's That's what the leader is. Leader doesn't mean like I tell you what to do and you follow me. You know what I mean? Leader for me means that like, I'm going to share the good and the bad things. And then you could look at that, take it in and try and figure out what makes sense for you. It's almost like a teacher, right? Like, like people like to say teachers don't teach, right? And, and, and that's an interesting thing that I didn't really understand, but now it kind of makes sense to me. Like teachers really don't, particularly as you get older, they don't really teach you. Like they guide you to learn, Hmm. you know what I mean? Like you really teach yourself technically. And I mean, you know, we can debate this. Everyone kind of looks at that differently, but that's the way I kind of have chosen to accept it. You know, we have the name teacher because they tell you things, but like, again, it's a relationship where you have to receive the information, mm-hmm. right? If you choose not to receive it, does that mean that I'm a bad teacher? You yes, know what I mean? I see what you're saying. Like yeah, if I have, yeah. if I have 10 students and half of them receive the information and half of them don't, does that mean that I'm a bad teacher? 
Maybe it could be. I'm not saying it doesn't. Mm-hmm. But does it? But there are two can sides, I, though. Can I speak in absolutes to say that this is the case, or you know, maybe I need to change the way that I share the information, or maybe because it's a two way relationship, maybe you just don't want it, right? Mm-hmm. Think about when you were in school. I'm, yo, know, I was in class a lot. A lot of the times, I didn't want it. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know I mean? Yeah, I don't want to be. There. I used to take. I tell people I used to take electives because I had science credits. I took astrology or whatever. I didn't want it. I just wanted the credits. I don't mm-hmm. care about astrology or astronomy, right. whatever the class is. So as, as a person's talking to me and I, you know, I'm getting whatever grades I'm getting from that class. Does that mean that that person is a bad teacher or does that mean that I just didn't want it? You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So like those are, those are important things for us to think about. Um, as we, again, like as you know, we have the discipline, we commit, we learn, and then now we're accepting that position of leadership. You know what I mean? Um, we have to always just think about again. It's 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 a two way relationship, right? And so psychologically, mm-hmm. we have to figure out well, what's you know what's the right path to success. Great. And the, the last two questions I think I have is, but first, give me a moment here. Let me think about this properly. Um, yeah, let's start with what what three books do you recommend? And I'll, I'll come back to the to the last question. Oh, for, okay. For people to read, just in general. Just it in could general? be technical. It could be things that I think have impacted you. Uh, it could be as an individual, yeah. um, technical career. Whatever you think is is good for people to digest. Yeah. Um, so again, I like to read books that are based on philosophy and psychology. Okay. Um, Obviously, I read technical books because of the job, but you know, mm-hmm. again, Are you a big reader, by the way. Um, I was like, I go in phases. Like, I read, okay. and then I, you know, I read more technical books sometimes, and then I mm-hmm. just check out, and so it, it kind of comes and goes in waves. Makes sense. Um, I'll tell you two of the books that I really liked, and then another one that I finished reading recently. So, so two books. One is called the Five People You Meet in Heaven." And is that um, Maury? Um, is- yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was a cool book. So the five people you meet in heaven was a really good book. Um, just really talking about, um, like these journeys that this, this guy is kind of going through to understand, um, you know, kind of just seek the meaning of life, I suppose, if you want to mm-hmm. kind of look at it from that perspective. Um, another book that I'm a huge fan of is called the alchemist. Um, uh, that's, that's a pretty, pretty common book. Um, a lot of folks have it on like their top, books to read, but it's, it's one of my favorite books to read as well. Um, Life of Pi, if folks have ever read Life of Pi, I think they ended up making a movie out of it. I never saw mm-hmm. the movie, but um, like the book was really good. Um, then most recently, actually just this morning, like, so I, I bought the audiobook of Will Smith's Will. And like, oh. I don't usually buy into the whole celebrity movie star autobiography book kind of thing, mm-hmm. but I, I, I went through the audiobook. And it was very, um, like, it's not what I thought it was going to be. It, it is, it's okay. a very psychological, therapeutic book. And, mm. I, and I say that as someone who is a father, someone who is, you know, has separated from his son's mother, someone mm-hmm. who's transitioned through different careers, someone who lives in a place that he wasn't born in, you know what I mean? And then thinking about work and success and family. Um, obviously I'm not an actor or anything of the sort, but then I relate to some of those stories. Cause a lot of those are things that I think about, mm-hmm. um, like, again, like, am I being a good father, right? Like, am I, am I doing the right things to provide for my family? Do I work too much? Um, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like psychologically, like as he's explaining these things and talking about the relationship with his parents and things of that nature, that particular book surprisingly hit a lot of nerves for me. Again, I just finished reading it, um, going through the audiobook this morning. So it's it's very top of mind right. as I'm thinking about it. And I think it's one of those that I'm probably going to read again. Because I like to read books more than once, right? Like like Life mm-hmm. of Pi and Five People That Mean in Heaven. Like I've read those books multiple times because I always think the first pass is like the understanding of, oh, okay, well, this is this is what this is about. And then the second or third time for me is really um, like ingesting knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then I think mapping back I, to what you felt in your own life as well, right? Yeah, I think I think there's a difference between understanding something and consuming it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can like you consume music, right? Like you know you listen to the radio, like we're consuming music, 
But one of the things I do, um, as an example, is like if I if I'm going through a moment in life, right? Because music for us means different things, and everyone has a different song that, based on what might have happened at that point in time of your life, that song has a particular psychological hold on you. Mm-hmm. What I like to do is I put on a song and I'd have the song on repeat. Like people don't like to listen to music around me because oh, I, I put do that all the time. I put music on repeat and I hear different things in the song every time I go through it again. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I say that now because I, I I treat books the same way. Right? Like you read through it one time, but you read through it again, and you're seeing mentally or you're you know you're verbalizing things that you might not have noticed the first time you went through it. Mm-hmm. Because now, like, your mind is in a different state as you're kind of going yes. through it again. And so, again, um, yeah, these are some just some of the things I like to do in terms of, like, trying to understand something and then just, like, consuming it, right? Like, it's it's very different. Yep. So, anyway, I think I think those will be some good books for folks to check out. Um, uh, for people that are watching, I know you're going to put this on YouTube. I'd love to see folks in the comments put down some of the books and things that they're reading and some of the music mm-hmm. they're listening to. Not just for like the sake of listening to it, but the, the things that really hold on to you psychologically and the things that inspire and motivate you and have you really think about life, right? And like yes. what's 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 your real purpose and what's your goal? Great. And I think the last question, I'll say it's the last one, but we'll see. We do the show to encourage people from the Caribbean region. And I think yeah. one of the hypotheses that I had was because we come from a multicultural place, uh, we relate to many different people a lot easier. And yep. what what components of your Caribbean heritage do you think have contributed to um, your su- success in your career or journey so far? I think it's exactly that, like exactly what you said. The fact that we are more diverse by default, right, um, as a region. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you look at the Caribbean, like we have, you know, folks from that are oriental looking, Indian looking, black, whites, Hispanic looking, right? And then, but we're all in the same place. Mm-hmm. And so for a lot of us, like, again, diversity is just, it's Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like, it's just another day. <laughs> you know, we don't really think about it as some other parts in the world do. So when we now spread out and we branch out and go to different parts of the world, you know, you know, people always say, oh, Caribbean people are so nice and they're laid back and they're this and they're that. And I think that's the case because, you know, for us, this is just normal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like when I when I came to college and I walked into a room of all kinds of people, like I had people from Russia and Arabs and Africans and all kinds of stuff. And I was just like, oh, this is Tuesday. Yep. <laughs> you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, it's, it's another day. It's not... You know, I wasn't stressed out about it. I know some people that's different for them. You know what I mean? Particularly yes. like Black Americans, that's a different situation for them, right? And so they react mm. psychologically to that very differently. But for me, it was Tuesday. It was just like, okay, whatever. You know, we live in. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's what it exactly. is. Like, I don't, I don't really think about it too tough. Um, but I think you know, socially speaking and professionally speaking, I guess I think that gives us the advantage, right? Because again, like, like I said earlier, right? Like comfort breeds confidence. I'm already comfortable being around people, anybody, different types mm-hmm. of people. I might not know them. Like I might not know about your culture or I might not know details about, I don't know, traditions and things of that nature. But me just walking into a room, like, I don't feel like, oh my God, like I'm weird, dear, weird or different. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I might not know certain things, but I don't feel uncomfortable asking the question. You see what I'm yes. saying? And so now, again, like comfort breeds confidence. We have that confidence now because we're comfortable. And so now, again, professionally and personally, you know, just being able to navigate the world, you know what I mean, for us is, is a little bit easier. Great. Um, so I wanted to thank you for, for your time. And, and I think as I've, um, I've experienced this conversation, but also now, maybe redigesting, summarizing in my head. And, and I, as I listened to it afterwards, you know, the, you've dropped some gems. And I think a couple of things I wanted to highlight is a lot of your success in your technical career, let's say, comes from a, a large part in the psychology or the, the mental aspect in which you approach your work, 
but also in addition to your life. And and I think most people, when they look at, oh, I want to get to Microsoft, I want to get to to this big company, and what do I need to study? And and that's only a a piece of the puzzle in addition to the time in which you have to dedicate to to grow your skills, but also grow your network and grow your clout uh, within a company, outside of the company. Um, so there's lots of things that you shared, and I that's the stuff I'm going to hold on to, to to upgrade my own self. And I like the fact that you said like you kind of want to be the best person in the room. So I'm silently um, tagging you, you know, yeah. to, to run behind again, you know? Yeah. You just, you just, you pick your target, right? Like, okay, that's the mm-hmm. target. That's what I'm going for. And like, for me, like those are micro goals. You know what I mean? Like the bigger goal is, you know, what do I like? What's, what's, what's the point? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, do I want to, I want to be a good storyteller. I want to be a leader. I want to, I want to be able to have, um, have trust, right. And respect, you know what I mean? But then in your journey to that, like, it's like steps, right? Like I want to get to the roof, but I got to take a step at a time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you've established, okay, this house is 14 floors tall or whatever the case, however, however tall the building is, I want to get to the top of the roof. What are those little steps that I need to take to get to that point from a, from a metaphor, uh, from a metaphorical perspective? You know what I mean? So like me, me targeting coworkers subconsciously and again, not aggressively, it's sure. just me being like, okay, um, these people are good. Like I want to be better than that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? But then again, you have to ask yourself, well, why? Like, why do I care? Why, why do I want to be better than that? Right. Mm-hmm. And the fact of the matter is if you, you know, again, like, why do I want to be the best basketball player or the best writer or whatever the case is, right? Like, like one, you want to be able to, show like the quality and and the the potential that you have Mm -hmm. but then you know again again i'm a father right like so the things that are important to me is to be able to set examples and to show that we really have no ceiling yes you know what i'm saying like the last Mm -hmm. thing i want to do is is put limitations on anybody and i don't want that to be a lesson for my son or my family or anybody else you know what i mean i look at the world as we can go as far as we want to go you know what I mean? There's only so far we can go individually. We mm-hmm. can go a lot further together. But, you know, even though that's the case, you know what I mean? I'm still going to push the ceiling as much as I can. And I want to, I want folks to look at me and say, you know, Cecil talks a lot of stuff, right? But I, I like to be the type of person that like, if I'm saying it, I'm going to prove it to you. Like I'm going to do yes. it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm here on your show and I'm saying these things, not because like, I didn't come with a notepad. I'm like, oh yeah, I got to tell Mark. All these kind of things, you know what I mean? Like we yeah, didn't yeah. even have like a pre-show setup situation. You know, this is just this is what I've done, and it's worked, and this is what I choose to continue to do because this is this is the psychology that I approach life with. You know what I'm saying? And so again, you as the the viewer, the watcher, the listener, have to kind of figure out well what's what's the way that you kind of want to live your life, right? Mm-hmm. Again, personally, professionally, and then how do you establish balance? Because I think once you establish balance, like the picture gets a little clearer and then now you'll know the why, you know what I'm saying? Like, I want to be the best, but why, right? Like I want to do this show, but why, right? Like I want to be able to travel the world and see people, but why, you know what I mean? Like, like, oh, yeah. like there's a million whys, right? And you got to be able to answer some of them, you know what I mean? As you're trying to like clarify, like what that psychological picture looks like for you. Great. Hey man, appreciate your time and you know we'll we'll definitely do some follow-ups and for anyone yeah, out there, you know, keep an eye on, on Cecil and what he's gonna do. And if you wanna go work for Stripe, you know, give him a, <laughs> give him a call. And... Yeah, hit me up, man. Let me know. Let me know. Cool. All right, later. All right.